How is the Bible the book of love? And did God really create the world for marriage? What's an effective pickup line according to sacred scripture? Join us today as we explore these questions and more with Dr. John Bergsma, a professor of theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville. I'm Father Dave Pavanka. I'm the president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Please stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavanka, and I'm president at Franciscan University in Steubenville. Today we'll be discussing what the Bible tells about God's love for us. I'm joined by our panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, professor of systematic theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, who is the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization here at Franciscan. I'm also pleased to welcome our guest, Dr. John Bergsma. Dr. Bergsma has taught biblical theology here at Franciscan University since 2004. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And he is the author of many books and articles on sacred scripture. Today we're going to be discussing his latest book, Love, Basics for Catholics, Illustrating God's Love for Us Throughout the Bible. Uh, thank you once again for joining us, John. Absolutely, Father. It's, it's blessing. great to be with you. It's always a blessing to have. Um, it was interesting. I know that you've written a number of books, and I, and I saw this, it's like, Okay, now he's getting around to God's love. You know, <laughs> is that the starting point? So, why this now? What was well, it about? You know, we, we see so much confusion about love, marriage, gender, sexuality out in our culture. And uh, this is nothing new, it's actually been going on for, for years. But finally, I had an opportunity to get around and try to get a book out that addresses that. Of course, it's been addressed by great books by many other people in different ways. But um, I really uh, wanted to put out a book that. Uh, briefly and in an impactful way uh, summarized the, the story of Scripture as really about marriage. Yeah. Because ever since I began speaking, you, you know, mentioned I've been teaching here, uh, you know, the undergrad since 2004. Uh, ever since I began teaching, uh, especially Old Testament, it dawned on me, look, we begin the biblical story with a marriage in a garden between Adam and Eve. We end the biblical story in with a marriage in a garden city between the lamb and his bride in the book of Revelation. And right in the middle of scripture, we have the Song of Songs, which is Solomon and his bride uh, in, enjoying their wedding in a garden. So this is trying to tell us something, the beginning, the middle, and the end of God's book to us, his book of love. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to get that out and, to, and uh, make an accessible book that people could quickly read through and, and grasp, um, you know, that picture of the Bible. It really is uh, God's book of love to us. I really appreciate it. When I looked at the cover, uh, I was thinking it was mostly, okay, God's love for us. But what you do and things that's really fun is actually just the different relationships that you have in the scriptures. And, and you see couples and some of them did a really great job and some of them, did, actually most of them didn't do a great job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was just fantastic the way you shared the stories and it helped uh, illuminate God's love for us. Ultimately, Indeed. this is, it is what the fundamental story is about, but through characters in the Bible, it's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I don't want to quarrel uh, with the schematic because it's really persuasive. Uh, and like everything you write, it has a disarming simplicity. Uh, but. Uh, I, I would think that you would insert Christ in the middle, not the Song of Songs, even though St. Bernard of Clairvaux reminds us that it's really the masterpiece wrought by the Holy Ghost. But I think Jesus would, would be the turning point between those two bookends of Eden and eternity. Well, indeed, but I think that the Song of Songs is all just about Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he is the Son of David, the Beloved One. Yeah. You know, that term, uh, the bride continually calls her uh, her husband, her, her uh, groom-to-be uh, beloved throughout um, no. the Song of Songs. And that's David in Hebrew. That's the, the consonants for David's name. So she's constantly saying, my David, my David. No. And so the song is set up to really be read about the son of David who is to mm -hmm. come, right. the great bridegroom. And so the Song of Songs is about Jesus and the yeah. church right. and, and, and about us and our relationship with the Lord as well. Yeah. Yeah. But do you maintain that marriage, again, 
was kind of always the plan, that, that God reveals himself. So just a little bit about that, that we find marriage in the garden and the relationship between God and his people and Adam and Eve. And, and it's, again, one of the things you do beautifully. It's not just about God's love, but it's about the nature of marriage and how that reveals love to one another, but also part of God's design in his creation. Yeah, indeed. I think that marriage is the icon of God's uh, personhood in creation. It's, it's like a, an icon of the Trinity because what do, you, what do you have in marriage? You have two persons totally open in love towards one another and their love becomes a third person. Mm. And that's a not exactly a model yeah, of, of the Trinity. Mm. First and second person, uh, their love is the third. And so I often tell my students, you know, marriage is the icon of the Trinity in the natural order. And so it's natural that the creation story begins that way and really culminates with marriage. Because if you think about the seven days of creation, what happens at the end? You know, as St. Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle say, what's last in execution is first in intention. Yeah. So the ending is not a throwaway uh, epilogue, it's really a climax. And what happens at the end is the creation of the bride and then the bride being brought to Adam. And then Adam bursts into song and you have the first lyric poetry, you know, this at last, is over my bones, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bone my you know, so yeah. you have this, this beautiful poetry that comes peeling out of uh, Adam's mouth. And that marks that, uh, that high point really of the creation story is marriage. And that's trying to tell us something, that marriage shows us something about the God that we worship, that he is a communion of persons. As John Paul II said, God is a family mm -hmm. and not a solitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, back in the fourth century, one of the great Cappadocians, St. Gregory Nazianzus pointed out to the Pneumatomachians, the ones who did not want to accept the full divinity of the Holy Spirit, that actually in the primordial moment when God was fashioning his own image and likeness in Adam, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life, Adam is something more than a creature. He really is, he, he is adopted, he's graced as a son. And then after he falls into the deep sleep, there proceeds Eve. And St. Gregory Nazianzus responded against the heretics saying, there you have a person who is in the likeness of the Holy Spirit, proceeding from the Father and the Son. Yeah. And, and St. Methodius picks up on this and describes the Holy Spirit as the rib of the Logos, mm. yeah. obviously echoing that sort of thing. Not implying that there is femininity in the Holy Spirit, but pointing out also as the Catechism says, there's not masculinity right. in right. the Father or the Son until the Son becomes human. But the, you, 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 these, these traits that we have in common with the animals, male and female, are raised and dignified, but they're not something that really is matched. It, it's paternity, it's filiation, and it's this power of love that is life-giving that marriage approximates in a way that is completely and exclusively unique. Nowhere else do you see human love expressed in a way that is life-giving. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is the Lord and the giver of life. And so we have a lot more work, I suppose, to delve into that. Right. But at the yeah. same time, we could say that, that marriage really is something that images God in a way that has gone for a long time, unnoticed or at least uh, yeah. neglected. If, if maybe we could descend from <laughs> the sublime to uh, the ridiculous, because you quote the monotones yes. early on in the book, <laughs> a, a perfectly forgettable uh, a vocal uh, group from the late 1950s. <laughs> Who wrote the Book uh, of Love? I'm, I appreciate the fact that you didn't sing that. You just put it out <laughs> yeah, there. Right, right. I mean, but it's very catchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody knows really who wrote the Book of Love. Right. I mean, well, they, they, they propose in the song, was it someone from above? And I think right. uh, they're the on the right yes. track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, he's sort of lost in the mists of abstraction, but he assumes a face, a human form. He becomes man, and God as man literally is writing the book of love yes, in his yeah. own life. And that's pretty astonishing. Right, right. So often the poets in popular culture hit upon something and have right. these intuitions yeah. that can really- And they wait for guys like, like you to explore that. it. Indeed. Yeah. But one of the things I think that you do is the, the relationship between the, and you said man and woman, because that there's something about life giving, the nature of life giving, that God gives his life, breathes life, as you just talked about. So this wasn't just accidental, that, that Adam and Eve coming together, the two become one, create life, that that is a part of marriage. Indeed. It's not just, and that's where today's culture is totally missed that part. It's right. just two people kind of love each other. That makes marriage, you, you'd say, absolutely not, that there has to be this man and woman openness to life. Yeah, it has to be openness to, you know, God's and love. And one man and one woman, one not one and, and one two, woman. in which right. causes a problem. <laughs> exactly. Who you'll go to, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, it comes back to modeling the Trinity, and uh, God's love is always open to life. And, you know, as, as John Paul II said, you know, uh, this is part of the deep reason why it is a sin to stop up the sources of life, mm -hmm. because God's life is, li is life, God's love is life-giving, and since we in marriage are called to model God, to be an imitatio dei, then our love likewise needs to always be open this, You, you to life. manifest this, or rather God does, who's writing the story uh, in really some of the most charming uh, ways. Uh, I didn't realize that Noah, when he, when he staffs uh, the boat, fills it with all kinds of creatures, they're all monogamous. They aren't. And that's why we have order and stability and peace on board, but outside, it's polygamous, and so we have chaos right. and, and despair. I, I had never thought of it like and that. And maybe speak to that. You said yeah. the oh, it was it, a part of the reason was because of the polygamous Oh, it, indeed. I mean, when you get to Genesis 6, uh, it says that the sons of God uh, saw that the daughters of men were fair and took to them su uh, such as they chose, which means as many as they wanted. And so you have this proliferation of polygamy at the beginning of Genesis 6, which is a social pathology. It's a social illness. Uh, having more than one wife causes all kinds of social chaos. A man having too many children properly to father and they grew up wild, etc. And that, all the effects that has on society. And it gets so out of hand that it grieves the Lord in his heart. He needs to, as it were, press the reset button on human history. Yep. Like we've got to wash everything clean and start over. But this was an insight, Father and, and Regis, that came to me from the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. Okay. The Essenes, who, you know, contemporaries of our Lord, pondering the scriptures, one of their arguments for monogamy was Noah's uh, okay. fact that he only had one wife. So there are eight people on the ark, right? Noah, his three sons, and uh, wives. four wives there, you know? And then every animal that goes on, go on by two by two. And the first time I, I read that, I thought, oh, well, that's silly. That's nice image, you know, yeah. Nice image, but the more I ponder, like, no, yeah. they've really got a point. Because as, as Regis so succinctly put it, outside the ark is polygamy and chaos, inside is monogamy and order. God clearly seems to be endorsing the order of monogamy right, right. and kind of restarting because after all, he created Adam and, and Eve, not Adam, Eve, and Sally or anything like this. He created one man and one woman. And that likewise, uh, the Essenes uh, recognized that the creational order of one man, one woman revealed God's plan. Uh, they called it the Yasoth Habaria, the principle of creation. Mm -hmm. So striking because our Lord appeals to the same thing in Matthew 19, going from the beginning it was not so, our Lord says in explaining marriage. Uh, also, like the Essenes, going back to prior to the fall to understand God's highest and best for human society. You know, the, um, the male-female animals coming in are for perpetuating the species, not because the animals get married. Right. You know, so the argument is by analogy, it goes so sure. far and then falls short. But I think what you're pointing to in Genesis 6 is so significant because polygamy actually originates, as you know, in Genesis 4, outside the covenant line of Adam and then uh, Seth. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Cain and then Lamech takes two wives and boasts about that along with the violence that he threatens to anyone who would, would approach him. And so when the sons of God take the daughters of men, you have the Sethites. In other words, polygamy is now spilling into right, the church. The covenant line. Yeah, yeah, the family yeah. of God. And at that point, yeah. the reset. So if you keep light and dark separate, if you keep sky and sea separate, if you keep the Sethites, the covenant folks, as a, separate from those who are wicked, it's really when the... Um, the mixed marriage, as it were. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Even and, within uh, the covenant line, the, the church, so to speak. Right, and, and I think the lesson, the takeaway yeah. for us is that the church has got to enforce the, the law of Christ, it does. teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. Yeah. Right. And uh, if the church does that, right. it will remain separate, but it will also remain powerful and fruitful in its mission to the but, world. But also reinforce the law of nature, because That's right. polygamy is an affront right, right. to the dignity of created being. Yes. I mean, it, it's not a matter of taste. You know, some people like pizza, others <laughs> pasta. Uh, maybe you like a bow tie. Maybe somebody else wears a string tie or no tie at all. That's subjective and maybe even a little bit whimsical. But the order of nature is fixed. It's unalterable. And if you violate it, you invite disaster. 
Right, right. And yeah. this is one of the points I really wanted to get across in the book, that marriage is not something for us to decide, not even something for the Supreme Court to decide. Right. This is, it's integral to God's mission for the human race. It's integral to the salvation story. And then would you say that looking in the Old Testament and the New, obviously, as well, that's why there's so much laws and so many prescriptions related to that because they saw the integrity of that? Indeed. Okay. And, and you see the, the patriarchs expending so much effort to make sure that the next generation marries well. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It's because as John Paul II says, you know, uh, salvation goes by way of the family. The church goes by way of the family. And so it's the perpetuation of the covenant line is gonna come from the next generation. The next generation comes from solid marriages. Yeah. And so we see Abraham bending over backwards to ensure that his heir, Isaac, has a godly wife in Rebecca. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my favorite love yeah, stories yeah, yeah, yeah. in Scripture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really all of a piece, isn't it? it is. I mean, the reason we argue against transgenderism is because uh, the sexes uh, are sort of uh, unalterable. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's a kind of recalcitrant fact of nature that we have to take account of. Uh, and so in marriage, you're going to have one man, one woman. Uh, it, it's not rocket science. It's <laughs> rooted in nature, the structure of being. Why don't we get it? Yeah. I mean, it's not just an aberration of behavior. It's a failure of, of vision. You don't see the truth the way things are. Yeah. So maybe uh, we will answer that question. Why don't we get it uh, in our next session? So please stay with us. St. Thomas Aquinas points out that what is last in execution is first in intention. In other words, the final step of a process is what you are hoping to achieve the whole time. For example, receiving your diploma on stage might be the last action of your high school career, but it was your goal from the beginning. So the marriage of Adam and Eve was the goal of all creation, even though it was the last action. Love Basics for Catholics Illustrating God's Love for Us Throughout the Bible by Dr. John Bergsma. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're trying to figure out who wrote the Book of Love, and I think we're going to figure this out. Um, but Regis, you had a, just a thought or reflection about the natural order. Yeah, I mean, it suddenly struck me that in, in the Book of Proverbs, we're reminded that without vision, a people perish. Vision has to do with the truth, seeing things as they are, reality. Uh, and you strike a, a congruity, uh, a marriage really, between uh, your perception of what is and what is. Uh, and you draw that connection, and we see the nature of reality in the very structure of the human person, male or female. I mean, it's not negotiable. There's not a third option. It's one or the other. And, and God is the author of, of of, of being, and so he inscribes a certain grammar, a syntax, into the constitution of that being, and we ignore it at our peril, and that's what we're seeing today. Indeed, yeah. But you know, we need, we need grace to see that, and it reminds me of John Paul II's uh, phrase that uh, Christ reveals man to man. Yeah. In other words, you know, we have to look at Christ to even understand ourselves, and we can miss such basic things as the superiority of, you know, a monogamous marriage. Right. It seems that, you know, in hindsight, with the grace of Christ, it seems obvious to us, and yet without the grace of Christ, as human history has shown, yeah. uh, we go very wrong in that, right. in yeah. that way. Uh, this idea that Christ reveals man to himself, I think, is something that helps us to understand that the natural law is not what Christ is meant to restore. You know, we are saved by the law of Christ, which takes up into itself the natural law, but also clarifies it so that people who are affected by sin in the Old Testament and yet are part of the saving plan, you know, mm -hmm. of the covenant, you have in Genesis, you can count on one hand, the number of monogamous. You have Noah, you have Isaac, you know, but uh, Abraham has one wife and two concubines. Uh, Jacob has two wives and two concubines. Solomon has 700 wives and 300 concubines. See where that guy and so, yeah. <laughs> and so you can see, you know, the, the prohibition in Deuteronomy 17, as you know, is not to multiply wives for yourself, especially right. for the king. But uh, it's one of those accommodations to the weakness of human nature after the fall and prior to the incarnation. When Aquinas, for example, uh, is working on proving monogamy, he applies himself to the natural law and seeks to demonstrate it and then you know, raises the objections 
and he realizes that you can't really refute all of them. And so he just resorts to the fact that, okay, in the beginning, God did this and Christ fulfilled it. And so Christ and the church are monogamous. So therefore, whatever you do with the law of Moses and the permissions there, yeah. you have the law of Christ. Yeah. Right. And it, the incarnation then gives us the grace through the sacrament of matrimony, not to make it easy, but to make it possible to do what even the patriarchs and the prophets and the kings right. weren't able yeah. to do. I would, I would add to that that, uh, you know, even in the Old Testament narrative, though, when we read the narrative, we see that um, every time someone takes a second wife, it, it does not Chaos. lead to good things. Yeah. Genesis 16, where Abraham takes Hagar as a second wife, there's language there that recalls the fall right. from Genesis 3, leads to massive trouble. God right. has to intervene to fix that situation. Right. Uh, the, the multiple wives. Jacob never wanted more than Rachel. That's right. Everybody else was foisted on him. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then it causes massive grief that takes the rest of Genesis to kind of calm that all down and get right. the brothers and to... It's, and, and, <laughs> and the brothers of Joseph, strictly speaking, are half-brothers. They are. Precisely because they're, yeah, they're sons right. of Leah. They yeah. hate the only son of Rachel, knowing that that was the one that Jacob really wanted to marry you know, in the first I, place. I, I wouldn't yeah. want to uh, suggest <laughs> that uh, celibacy could be an impediment to understanding marriage, because uh, uh, you, you think you. of Carol <laughs> and, 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 and Father Dave and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Pope St. John we Paul. Nobody understood human love better than John Paul II and, and the logic of the gift. And, and you don't even have to be a woman to understand uh, the feminine uh, mystique. Shakespeare gave us Juliet, and that was an incomparable insight into her mystery. But I think maybe if Thomas Aquinas had been married, it would have been indicated to him by his wife that I'm not going to put up with competition here. You, you can't share me with several other girls who may be more attractive than, than I. I mean, you know, you're tempted after your first fight. Maybe I, I need to go elsewhere because I'll find someone a little more amenable. But that's poppycock. You know, you know that it's not natural. It's perverse to have more than one. Right, right, yeah. 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 Well, you're, you're up against the patristic tradition as well, <laughs> you know. But the, I mean, the point is, we do things that are absurd apart from the Holy Spirit. Right. And that the sacrament of matrimony is arguably the single most underrated of the seven. We think we're just kind of restoring the natural law, and we are doing that. But what we're also doing is receiving something that is suffused with the, the love of Christ for right. His bride yeah. to enable us to do what we could not do, right. you know, uh, apart from that power. And, and Scott, you know, there, there's intimations of matrimony as a source of grace all through uh, Scripture, even from the beginning, where, um, where the Lord says, I'll make a helper complementary to him in Genesis 2. And that word for helper or help, azer, you know, I was shocked by this, I, completely surprised. You search the whole Old Testament, and that term azer is never used of help that, uh, that a, um, a, a subordinate yeah. or a servant provides right. to somebody else. It's always used of help from God or from a king. It's help from above. And so already the idea that the spouse provides help from above, provides divine help, is anticipated there in, in you know, the fullness of matrimony in which it becomes a means of grace, where a uh, husband and wife become sources of the help from above, which is the grace of the Holy Spirit towards one another. And so you have this unique sacrament of matrimony where it's the only sacrament where lay persons uh, bestow it upon each yeah. other. Yeah. They're, They're the, the ministers, ministers of the sacrament. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe to just go with that a little bit, the, the idea of the marriage, the ceremony, the sacrament that you make reference in, in Sinai, that there's actually a marriage that takes place in that. So maybe speak to that and, and how is that um, a marriage? How do we see that as marriage? Who's getting married? Right. The whole Sinai event. Sure. So Sinai is, is central to the Old Testament and to the Jewish understanding of their relationship to God. We better to say the Israelite understanding of their relationship to God. And uh, when you look at Exodus 24, when that covenant between God and His people was solemnized, you can see the echoes of a marriage vow there when, for example, the people say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Mm. And you can hear that echo of, I do, in that. And, and the later Israelite prophets clearly understood that Sinai event as a betrothal between God and His people. And that's why we have the, those rich nuptial allegories in like Ezekiel 16 and 23 and uh, throughout Isaiah and in uh, Jeremiah as well, Hosea, Hosea 1 through 3, especially Hosea chapter 2, 
where are the prophets getting that? They understand that covenant between God and his people as, as a marriage. And of course, that's brought to fruition and fullness by our Lord. And so when we look in the Gospels and we see Jesus, you know, frequently using wedding parables, you know, or parables about a marriage mm -hmm. feast to speak about the kingdom of God. We're like, why does he keep coming back to that theme? Yeah. It yeah. goes back to the understanding of Sinai as the marriage between God and his yeah. people. Well, he not only he comes back to that because that's where he began, right, yes. with the marriage feast at Cana. That's an extraordinary story. What, what did you put down, 180 gallons <laughs> of fine vintage wine? When I got married, uh, I was in charge of the wine, and somehow the steward lost it. So I think we had <laughs> lemonade. So I can appreciate Jesus. I mean, and you mentioned that, that a lot of engaged couples would be inviting yeah, yeah. to sort of bless their marriage. I mean, the stories that you tell are really wonderful like uh, like uh, Rebecca and uh, Isaac. That, that's an amazing story. The fact that the head, the steward is sent out to find somebody, a suitable helpmate for Isaac. And here's a, a girl who not only agrees to water these guys, but the camels as well. And so he, she's the perfect helpmate for this guy. Not only is she pious and pretty, she's also practical. And right. doesn't she become sort of the mediatrix of this new people of God, the Israelites? She does. She's the yeah. source. Yeah, Re Rebecca is so important to the story. You know, the, the, the servant of Abraham goes out to court her on behalf of Isaac. Yeah. And he strikes that deal as he's coming into town. Lord, I'm going to ask the first girl for a drink. Yeah. And if, <laughs> if she volunteers to water my camels, then I'll know that she's the bride. <laughs> That's you the know? deal maker. And it's, it's and a hole in one. Right. I mean, the very first girl right. that he asks yeah, for, right. she yeah. volunteers. So any young woman that's going to volunteer to water all this, all these strangers' camels. He's probably got six camels in his entourage. They drink about 30 gallons at a time. Yeah. So she just volunteered to lift 180 gallons of water out of a well. <laughs> so, you know, as you point out, Regis, she's pretty, she's polite, she's generous, and she's probably pretty physically fit, too. Yeah, she's right. able to yeah, yeah. get all that water out of the well. And, and all of those are good qualities. And then she's so instrumental in salvation history, she's the one that, that God graces with the wisdom to recognize that Jacob is the better heir. And yeah, if she intervenes, right. yeah, yeah. you know, with her husband to direct uh, salvation history, it's like turning the, 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 the points on a track, you know, you shift the track and the train goes in a different direction. And so everything was headed towards Esau. And then she just <laughs> says, no, we're going to intervene here. Women have a way shift of doing the things. Like exactly. that, right? <laughs> right. I think one of the things that you, you talk about is the well becomes a pretty significant place. It does. It, you know, the, the story yeah. that you just shared. So maybe about that, that the well becomes this place uh, pick up lines and, yes. and relationships and encounters. Speak to that, the, the significance of the well in this whole story. Yeah, and so starting in Genesis 24 where uh, give me a drink is the, is the pick up line to yeah, yeah. recognize who's the intended bride and Rebecca responds generously. Uh, but then you, ha you have that again later in scripture, of course, in John 4, yeah. where our Lord very, you know, provocatively goes to this town in, um, in Samaria and sits down beside a well in Sychar. Jacob's well. Jacob's well, yeah. right. intentionally yeah. evoking this memory. Yeah. Yeah. And then a woman comes out, even though it's noon, not the time when women come out to a well, and Jesus asks her, give me a drink. And that calls to mind Genesis 24. And yeah. then we look at how she responds, but she says, you know, well, why do you ask a drink from me? I'm a Samaritan woman, you're a Jewish man. So we don't get that, uh, that generous response of Rebecca, yeah. but in the unfolding dialogue, Jesus is really wooing her in a sense, in a spiritual sense, uh, and, and through her, her people, uh, the Samaritans. And we need to remember, Father, that the Samaritans were descendants of the Northern Israelites and what lies behind that whole dialogue in John 4 where Jesus draws that woman towards himself to recognize him as the Messiah. And then she goes and evangelizes the town and the whole town comes to recognize him as the Messiah. And remember the Messiah is a bridegroom. That's mm -hmm. the Song of Songs, okay? And what lies behind all of that is Hosea chapter two, where Hosea, the one prophet sent to Northern Israel, 
promise that God would come one day to woo the northern Israelites back to himself. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing in John 4. These are the last visible descendants of northern Israel, and he's drawing them back to himself using these images from the Old Testament. And the, and the first time Samaritans are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, 2 Kings 17, you have them being conquered and resettled by five idolatrous peoples who bring in their five Baals. Right. We associate Baal with Baal worship, but it's also the Hebrew word for your husband if you're a concubine. And so you've had five husbands, but the one you're with now, not necessarily cohabiting tonight with, but the one that you're with right now at is not well. your husband. Yeah. And so with Isaac finding his bride at a well, and Jacob and Moses, the Old Testament background that the Samaritans would share because the Samaritans' Bible was only the Pentateuch. Right. And so those three outstanding examples would give her that moment of grace where like, sir, you know, I perceive yeah, you're yeah, a prophet yeah, yeah. instead of I perceive you're a gossip. How, you know, how do you know about my five husbands? You know, But I, it really is the moment of grace that touches her in her brokenness and then raises her up right. to represent to the people of God. I mean, this is St. Fotina in right. the tradition, yes. a martyr, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the one who kind of prepared the way for the Samaritans to be evangelized. And what's so beautiful there is, you know, she was the town bad girl. You right. know? That's why she's coming out at noon when none of the other ladies are going to yeah. be there. But Jesus uh, draws her out in that conversation. And when she finally expresses that deep down, she herself has been waiting for the Messiah. Yeah. Right. She says, when the, the Messiah comes, mm -hmm. he will explain all things. This is the last woman in Sychar that you would expect would be harboring a hope for the Messiah right. deep down in her heart. But when that little glimmer of faith comes out, that's where Jesus sees yeah. his opportunity. She's the Mary Magdalene of the North. <laughs> and, and right before John 4, John the Baptist refers to Jesus as the bridegroom. Right. And it's like, we'll turn the page and see how that happens. Not, never really clear where we're going to go on this show. <laughs> the, uh, the, the town bad girl. So uh, stay with us. We have more about this, just this really beautiful images that the scriptures provide us about love and marriage. We are also living in a very difficult time. When marriage is disappearing, family life is falling apart, and loneliness is rising, even in the church. But God can still work through humble people who love Him, love each other, and follow God's plan for marriage. The future lies with God-fearing couples like Boaz and Ruth. Love Basics for Catholics, illustrating God's love for us throughout the Bible by Dr. John Bergsma. Walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs on a Franciscan University pilgrimage led by inspiring spiritual directors. You'll explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage in the Holy Land, Poland, France, Austria, Italy, and more destinations. On each pilgrimage, you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents, which we record here at the Com Arts Studio at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and the equipment. Our theology professors, Dr. Martin and Dr. Hahn and Dr. Bergsma and I are discussing marriage in the Bible and how it represents God's love between us and his people. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the New Testament and you do something really beautiful at the very beginning of Jesus as a baby and the Magi are bringing gifts to a bridegroom. Indeed. Well, you wouldn't notice that until yeah, you Yeah, you, you wouldn't notice it. it. But yeah, the, the three gifts of the Magi, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we have songs about that and traditional associations with what those represent. And I wouldn't quarrel with the different associations. Sure. But actually, if you look at frankincense and myrrh, they're only used in romantic contexts. They're only mentioned together, frankincense and myrrh, in romantic contexts in the Old Testament. And uh, especially associated with Solomon mm. and his bride in the Song of Songs. And so the Magi bringing those gifts to the child Jesus are really marking him off as the bridegroom Messiah from his infancy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you talk about that, that, that Jesus, we understand now that Jesus and we are the bride, that he is the bridegroom. And you, uh, on numerous occasions, the, his, first wed, his first miracle being at the wedding of Cana. So you make this connection between he is the bridegroom. Maybe you just speak to that. And, and then how are we supposed to be a bride. What is that? How, how do we do that, right? I don't yeah. know how to do that. I never got married. I don't know how to do this. 
Sure. So, I mean, uh, you know, the, the Gospel of John is where this is richest. And uh, we begin the Gospel of John, of course, with the Lord's first sign, which is the wedding at Cana, and uh, has a lot to say about matrimony. I mean, think about, think about it this way. Whose job does Jesus do at this uh, wedding? Well, he does the bridegroom's job because in Jewish culture, it was the bridegroom's role to provide the wine for the wedding feast. Jesus steps in and does that. Let's ask another question. Does he do it well or does he do it poorly? <laughs> Regis says he does it really well. Yeah, yeah. 180 yeah. gallons of fine French Cabernet. I think he, he did it really well. And so at that opening miracle in John, he reveals himself as the supernatural bridegroom. And, and in Judaism, a bridegroom was supposed to bring joy to his wife based on the command in Deuteronomy 24 that a bridegroom was to be free for one year, the first year of marriage, to gladden his wife. Mm -hmm. And wine is the source of gladness in the Old Testament. Psalm 104 says that wine gladdens the heart of men. So there's also that, you know, looking at this through Jewish eyes, Jesus is the one who brings this abundance of wine, mm -hmm. which is joy, an overabundance, that's an overabundance yeah, that's to true. this bridal people at, uh, at this uh, Cana uh, wedding feast. And that episode at the beginning of John is parallel to the cross, yeah. ironically, because yeah. Jesus mentions, my hour has not yet come when the Blessed Mother asks him indirectly to provide wine. That Jesus' response, my hour has not yet come, implies that an hour is going to come when he's gonna provide truly for this lack of wine. And of course, the hour in the Gospel of John is the hour of the Passion. And so when we move from Cana to the cross, there on the cross, we see our Lord saying, I thirst, which picks John up- John 4. John 4, which picks up right. Genesis 24. And you know, uh, St. Teresa of Calcutta intuited what our Lord was really asking there. He was really asking for the, the love of humanity. He has come as the bridegroom of all, uh, of all the, the whole human race. And he asks for the bride to step forward and respond to his thirst. The thing that you did beautifully is that the Lord in his generosity gives us this wonderful French cab, right? right. And what we give is some wine yeah, right. and, and that's enough. I mean, right. Yeah, it's, it says when he thirsts, they, they, they have some oxos there in Greek, some soured wine. They put it in a sponge. Have you ever tried to drink from a sponge? You know? I have. <laughs> so <laughs> so you have, you, have, uh, you know, wine vinegar and only enough to dampen his mouth mm -hmm. versus what he provided when we were thirsty at Cana. Yeah. And I think what John is doing is showing a contrast between how uh, insipid we are, as it were, in reciprocating the love of our divine bridegroom. And we, we almost weep when we read that in, in it's really John 19. Right? We say, you know, I want to make up for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to give my life. I want to I want to return, you know, the 180 gallons of fine French import there. And, and that, you know, that's why I think that we can really take that to our prayer in our different vocations and say, how can, how can I in religious life or how can I in marriage or whatever my vocation is, how can I really return something better to Jesus than that sponge full of sour wine? It, that's a great theme, that of, of sheer excess. Everything is over the top, yes. perfectly extravagant, far more than, than, than justice might uh, require. Uh, you, you've been talking about Cana and, and the cross and maybe beyond that, uh, the crypt. But if we could go back to the crib uh, for just a moment, I'm, I'm really struck by the fact that the Magi are not Jews, right? I mean, they represent the Gentile world. I mean, they're learned, they're mysterious. The shepherds are very simple, sort of stupid. They're, 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 they're Hebrews and they worship, they fall down, prostrate before the child. But the fact that the Gentiles come is I think a testimony to this great decisive theme of the whole Joannine gospel, the enfleshment of the word, the marriage between the word and the world, it happens. I mean, it happens in the womb, but now we can see it. This, this word emerges from the womb, from the birth canal, and it's good. It's fitting that the Gentiles should be there to acknowledge this fact. And yeah. to see this as the bridegroom, that, that's an extraordinary uh, mystery. Sure, yeah, and it's harking back to the idea of Solomon. You know, wise men came from the East yeah. to, uh, to venerate Solomon and to hear his wisdom. 
uh, Jesus as a child prodigy. You know, Solomon did that <laughs> right. at, at the peak of his career. Jesus is two years old and already, you know, he's drawing the wise men from the east, recognizing him as the bridegroom king, which Solomon right. was. You know, right. Solomon tried to marry the whole world one woman at a time. Right. Our Lord right. offers himself to marry yeah. the whole world monogamously yeah. because we are one bride. Right. We are And, and it really testifies to the patience of God that he would wait two years before the Gentiles are made privy to right. this, this great miracle. Right, right. But you, you raise a, a great point about the, the, the nuptial nature of the Incarnation, Regis. And one of the few times in the modern lectionary that we read the Song of Songs is on December 21st, just a few days before uh, we celebrate, of course, the Feast of the Incarnation or Christmas. And, and uh, we read from Song 2 on that day, just a few days before Christmas, and it, it kind of jarring because it's in the yeah. middle of winter for yeah, most yeah. of us. Yeah. And, and, and Song 2 is full of this springtime wedding imagery. And like, why would we read this? Uh, it's almost like an elopement uh, yeah. uh, account in, in Song 2, if you look at it. Why would we read this romantic springtime poetry just before Christmas? And it's because the church fathers understood that the incarnation was the wedding of divine nature and human nature. Mm -hmm. The two become one. Yeah. The two become one flesh in, uh, in, in Christ. Yeah. And, and this is unique to the Christian religion. No other world yeah. religion has that kind of intimacy between their God and, and His people. Yeah. You know, the role of Mary is significant here, although it strikes us all, I suspect, as counterintuitive because she's a mother, not a bride. She's Joseph's bride, and so the virginal marriage that they have in the natural order would seem to preclude a kind of mystical marriage. But again, across the board, in the Eastern Fathers and in the Western Fathers, as you know, uh, she's the new Eve, he's the new Adam. And so in their own consecrated celibacy, they have also taken a marriage up mm -hmm. to its perfection, you know, so that woman at the wedding at Cana in John 2, woman behold your son, there at the foot of the cross in John 19, these two bookends really do serve John's function of presenting the gospel as the fulfillment. It's a new creation. It is a new Sinai. It's a, you know, it's a new Exodus and all of that. But there really is a sense in which Our Lady is a virginal bride and a fruitful mother. And not only does she anticipate what the church is called to be, she embodies it. Yes. And so the, um, the bride in this case is not just an elusive symbol, it is an embodied woman. Yes. And I, I think then, how do we experience that sort of bridal receptivity, mm -hmm. especially as men? I, I, you know, I've always kind of wondered yeah, about yeah. that. Well, in the, in the sacraments, obviously, and you know, the receptivity. The, the, in, indeed, yeah. So Cana, you know, it's, it bespeaks matrimony, but it also bespeaks Eucharist. And John elegantly uh, does that by calling the servants, not by the usual Greek word douloi, but when they come forward to take the wine and bring it to the uh, chief uh, uh, officer of the, of the wedding and, and the wedding guests, he calls them diakonoi. Yeah. deacons. So right. the deacons come forward. And I'm sure that the early Christians could not have missed that. Missed that. Yeah. So see how Cana is yeah. the mass. Jesus, you know, transforms one substance into another. We can almost say transubstantiates the water into wine. The deacons come forward, the diaconoi, okay. bring it to the wedding the gifts. So the early Christians, and, but it's tied, it's tied then to the cross. And at the cross, shortly after, saying, woman, behold your son, which is probably the language of the birthing chamber. When else do you have to announce to a woman that she's got a son, right. if not in the birthing chamber? Shortly thereafter, of course, our Lord's side is pierced and outflow the, the blood and water, which the Father saw as, yes, the Holy Spirit, but under the sacraments, mm. uh, water for baptism as throughout John, blood for the Eucharist. And so how do we experience Christ as our, our spouse? It's, it's at Mass. It's when we take his body into our own, when we receive the sacred host, when we drink from the cup, his body and blood. Only in matrimony and Eucharist do you have yeah, these unions, really unions of yeah. bodies. That's beautiful. Yeah, John emphasizes the signs too, and it's a throwback to Exodus where Moses performs the signs. And at the earliest stage, his first sign you know, is uh, turning water into the blood. blood, the water of the Nile. But in Exodus 7, it also happens to be the water in the stone jars. 
right. the same term that we find in John. Yes. There were 101 ways that Jesus yeah. could have performed that miracle, but with the woman there at her behest, he takes the water in the stone jars, turns it into wine, and then at the cross, the water and the blood that flow really do anticipate this. I mean, I don't think John would be looking down at us from heaven saying, gee, I, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> you guys are so right. genius. Right. Right. Okay, in our last couple of minutes, John, we begin in Genesis, but you also end in, in uh, Revelation. So you yeah. talk about marriage and the union of marriage. So maybe just a word or two about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, Revelation can be a scary book, but it's ultimately also a romantic comedy. It's a rom-com. <laughs> it's a rom-com, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It goes through some scary parts. There's some hecticness, but at the end, uh, you know, the the intended couple gets together that we knew they would, and that's, of course, uh, the, the Lamb, who is Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, going, you know, referencing back to the gospel, and, and the bride. And the, and the bride comes out of heaven dressed as a bride, adorned for her husband, it says. She's a perfect cube, kind of odd dimensions for a wedding <laughs> dress, uh, uh, 1,500 miles on a side, 12,000 stadia. So she's an enormous cube. This is a big wedding dress. But, but the, the image of the cube is significant there, Father, because the only cubicle thing in the Bible is the Holy of Holies. Yeah. And so this bride that comes out of heaven um, prepared for her bridegroom is really an image of the church. And why is the church portrayed as a perfect cube? Because the church is one big Holy of Holies. In the Old Covenant, God's presence was only localized in the Holy of Holies where he resided, as it were, where God's presence was localized above the cherubim throne on top of the Ark of the Covenant. But now in the New Covenant, God's presence is localized in each one of us because the Holy Spirit resides in us. That's why St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the yeah. Holy Spirit? So from the Pope to the most recently baptized infant, every member of the church is the, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we are one big Holy of Holies coming out of heaven to be wed to uh, our bridegroom. And of course, you have the beautiful image of uh, the new Jerusalem and the streets of gold and uh, the river of life coming the th from the throne of God. And we say, well, this is heaven. These are images of heaven. And that's true. They are images of heaven, but they're also images of the mass. When we go to the Holy Eucharist, uh, we drink from the Holy Spirit that is flowing from the throne of God. When we go to Mass, we eat from the tree of life that's growing on both sides of the river of life, as we see there in Revelation 22. Um, and, and we are experiencing with the angels and the saints that beautiful nuptial communi communion that John uses to describe our final state. You just get the sense that this might all have been part of God's design. <laughs> so. He did it on purpose. Yeah, that's right. Uh, please stay with us as our panel and our guests will give us some final thoughts. The whole drama of Jesus' passion is the story of the bridegroom giving his body to and for his bride. In his death, Jesus gave us his body so that we could be saved for eternal life. And every time we celebrate Mass, that gift of His body is renewed. At Mass, He thirsts for our love, even as He satisfies our thirst for God's grace. And we should return His love to Him, satisfying His thirst as He satisfies ours. Because of this, the Mass is called the Wedding Feast of the Lamb. Love Basics for Catholics, illustrating God's love for us throughout the Bible by Dr. John Bergsma. When you see the world through a Catholic lens, you see God's hand at work in human history. You see the true, the good, the beautiful. Franciscan University of Steubenville's Master of Arts in Catholic Studies is an online program that offers courses in literature, biology, art, theology, psychology, all taught from a distinctively Catholic perspective so you can see the world with Catholic eyes. Find out more about the Masters in Catholic Studies. Go to franciscan.edu slash mcs. The Catholic faith teaches that God is a communion of three persons. The bond of love between the first two persons is so strong that it becomes the third person. Marriage is like that. The love of two persons becomes embodied in a third, the child. In this way, marriage becomes an image, an icon of God. Love Basics for Catholics, illustrating God's love for us throughout the Bible by Dr. John Bergsma.
Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment, so I'd invite uh, Regis to your yeah. final thoughts. Uh, John, that's a marvelous book that uh, you wrote. I so admire what you've done, and the way you present it uh, in the studio is, is so scintillating, so beguiling, but at the same time, really profound, really uh, uh, incisive. I, I guess the only misgiving I have are those uh, damn stick uh, <laughs> figures that you draw. I mean, I, I find those distracting. And I, I was scratching my head. Now, would John Henry Newman do that? And obviously not, but then he wasn't uh, an American. Okay. And he wasn't an artist. And he didn't have kids. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I mean, the, the book itself is, is tremendous. And I'm learning so many things in, in the conversation, like rom-com. I had no idea what the hell that meant, but it means a romantic comedy, right? right. Sort of like what Dante wrote. It ends. Yes. Yeah, on Absolutely. a happy note, the outcome is good. Yes. I mean, the guy begins in a dark wood, but when he ends, he's ravished by the Blessed Trinity. I mean, why, why shouldn't that somehow replicate in, in, in the imaginative order what in fact took place in the real order of grace? I mean, that's the order that we're dealing with, grace. It doesn't wipe out nature, but it perfects it. And, and you describe it so well with that theme of spousal love that uh, I, I'm just completely captivated by it. I hope you sell a great number of books. And in the second edition, just leave the stick figures uh, on the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you so much, Regis. Yeah, duly noted, Scott. There is such a paradox in God's love that you sort of back us into. On the one hand, we add nothing whatsoever to the eternal trinity. On the other hand, he finds us irresistible. It's like, how does that work? Yeah. Well, I mean, he creates us out of nothing. And with our assistance, which only comes from his grace, we are sanctified. We are made partakers of the divine nature. Talk about a romantic comedy. Yeah. I mean, but I, I also want to underscore something that is much more mm, uh, mundane, and that is the series of books of which this is now the most recent. You did Bible basics for Catholics. You did New Testament basics for Catholics, Psalms basics for Catholics on the book of Psalms, and now love basics. Am I forgetting one? No, that's all okay. I mean, and the, the cumulative effect of these books is people read this and they see a massive amount of scholarship distilled in the most winsome way. Yeah. And I would also want to say that uh, you have published four volumes called The Word of the Lord for year A, year B, year C, and what is the other one? Feasts and Solemnities and Feasts, yeah. And, you know, we've done these shows together, uh, you and I, for the St. Paul Center, but what I find is that clergy pick up those volumes, Word of the Lord, and they're going to be tempted just simply to read them for the homily. But instead, they're sort of inspired, they're inseminated, they're uplifted. Lay people, too. And so to take the biblical scholarship that you got at Calvin and Notre Dame and that you impart to our students here at Franciscan, uh, it is just such a grace. Talk about fruitful receptivity. Um, and it's, so, it's almost excessive, too. So I don't want to, I should have asked you to plug your ears mm -hmm. so that I could plug your books. <laughs> you know? But uh, I really want to just give thanks to you and even more to our Lord and the Holy Spirit for inspiring you, because I know how little time you have, and I also know how you, you turn it into French cab, <laughs> or Christ does through you. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Final thoughts. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, you know, despite Regis's protests, I, I really do have an affection for the stick figures. And, uh, you know, th this developed out of, you know, trying to keep 18 to 22 year olds awake for a 75 minute period, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, doodling on the board, you know, and I, I stand in front of the image as I'm writing, and then they're craning their necks to see what is he doing, you know, yeah. it really, it really helps. And, but I'm a visual learner. Yeah. And uh, I like an image to give me a mental hook. Uh, to hang some thoughts on. And I also find that the, uh, the, the stick figures are disarming. They, you know, we, we, find that we often find the Bible intimidating. Folks are like, oh, I'm going to write a book about the Bible, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, but, but when they see, oh, you know, it's got some artwork to it, you know? It's, you know, <laughs> it's and, and art. When, when people yeah. relax, yeah, <laughs> I think it's It's art. disarming. Yeah, it it, when, when people relax, I think uh, we learn better yeah. when, we're, when we're relaxed. And, uh, but, you know, seriously, Father, I, I do hope uh, that a lot of people will read the book, not just because I'd like to sell them and my wife does the family finances. Yeah, that's great. She's always encouraged me to push books. But, uh, but more broadly, this gives the narrative um, that is the basis
basis for the ethics of marriage. You know, we just had Jordan Peterson uh, over at Franciscan uh, not long ago. You interviewed him, and he gave this uh, long talk where he basically said that ethics comes from story. And if we don't have a macro story of the world, we don't have a narrative about, uh, you know, all of the universe, then we lose universal ethics, we lose universal morality. And so he's made this shift in his own career towards looking at scripture, because it argues the Bible is the only viable meta narrative by which we can have social ethics, et cetera. And that's all, you know, kind of sophisticated way of saying, but you gotta know the story to know what's right and wrong. Right, right. And so this is retelling the story of marriage from the beginning of time to the end of time, quite literally, mm -hmm. so that we can get marriage right. Because as John Paul II says, the church goes by way of the family. Family. We got to get marriage right so that we get family right and so we get church right. Amen. Thank you so much. It, it's always a pleasure to, to have you with us. If uh, we'd like, if you would like more uh, information on today's topic, we have a free handout, an article written by Dr. Bergsma on the Book of Ruth. The article is titled, dare I say, Chick Flick with Matrimonial Message. Yeah, perfect, fantastic. If you just go to faithandreason.com slash presents or call the number we'll provide momentarily. Um, and I will just say I was in China a number of years ago working with the underground church and somebody I'd mentioned I was from Francis University and somebody said, there's a professor there. He writes books and he draws stick oh figures. God. So we just, <laughs> right. okay. They had confused you with Confucius. All the way, all the way over there. His right, artwork yeah. is, is captivating people. Yeah. Um, I must say, reading your book first, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, but it made me, honestly, when I was done with it, I was really grateful for my mom and dad when yeah. it was all in said is that, you know, I just think of, of my home that I grew up with, a father, a mother, safety, um, love, discipline, all of the things that, that it's supposed to, and then just in the world today, I recently did a wedding, and unfortunately the bride's parents were divorced. Mm. And just the complicatedness, that, that that became complicated. There was the stepfather and the stepmother and this, and, and, and where they're gonna sit, and, and just this, you could see her being torn about where, and so I was just profoundly grateful for obviously my mom and my dad in, in what they provided for me and, and then how that has ultimately revealed the Lord to me and his love for me and his um, security for me and, and a safe place for me. And it just takes me back to, to the whole design of family and marriage and, and God's revealing himself for us. So I was just profoundly grateful for that. And the other is, as you alluded to a couple of times, just the craziness that we find ourselves in. So in the midst of all this, I think this was, um, a beautiful opportunity for us to refocus those things that I think instinctively we know, but you provide an insight and clarity and simplicity that I think was really, really compelling. So I'm, I'm profoundly grateful for that. And, and maybe just as we begin to, to conclude, just to pray for the couples, you know, pray for the, the sacrament of marriage and, and the blessing and the order that it brings to us in the culture in our church and for the confusion that we find ourselves. So. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing, particularly upon uh, those men and women who are viewing our program that are married, uh, that you pour out your grace upon them. We pray for those whose marriage has suffered or those who, for one reason or another, uh, their marriage has come to an end. Lord, that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit to bring your healing, your grace, and your peace. We thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you for your love for us and the way that you continue to draw us to yourself. May Almighty God pour his blessings upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your time. Download a free handout on today's topic at faithandreason.com slash presents. You can also watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request the handout by emailing us at presents at franciscan.edu or reach us by phone for today's handout by calling 800-783-6447. That's 800-783-6447.